hang out here in case people all have trouble with my name. Hey, Sam, how's it going? Good, you're muted right now. There we go. I'm well. How are you? I'm good. Um, great. Well, I'm going to I'm going to mute myself and my stuff and um, I'll let everybody in and you can get it kicked off. We've already got 43 people in the waiting room. Whoa. OK, here we go. <laughs> awesome, Sam. OK. Wow, all right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um cool. Well, it's it's just after 3, so I think we'll just jump on in. Um so I'm going to share my screen. Oh, uh host has disabled participant screen sharing. Um if if somebody at Rick could let me screen share, that would be great. Give them a sec. Okay, um, give it a try. Okay, cool. Here we go. Okay. Uh, can people see Storyboard Pro? Sorry, I, have, I actually have no way to tell if uh, people are responding. Let me get the chat open. Oh, yes, I see thumbs up. Wonderful. Um. Okay, cool. There's the meeting chat right on. Okay, cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. Um, okay, cool. Let's let's jump in. Um, so, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to my storyboarding talk. My name is Sam Tung. I'm a storyboard artist for live action, video games, uh, animation. Um, and I hope y'all are having a wonderful Brick Summit. It's very cool um, that that we all get to be here today. So, uh, so yeah. So I'm excited. Um, I hope you're excited, and and we'll jump in. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, I will kind of try to watch the chat. Um, feel free to like throw questions in there, but um, I am gonna try to leave time at the end to like do some questions and stuff like that. So if I don't see it as we're like flying by, um, I, I will try to get to everything. Um, so yeah. So let's let's just get going. Um, you know, this is we we've only got about an hour together today, so so I I can't cover. Everything I know about storyboarding, but um, but we'll we'll cover as much as we can and and uh, hopefully have some fun. Okay, um, so who am I? My name is Sam Tong. I'm a storyboard artist. Um, those are some of my social media handles. Uh, I'm a member of the Art Directors Guild and the Animation Guild. So those are two uh, union locals um, in in Los Angeles that cover most of the storyboarding work uh, that's done in film and animation. Um, the, oh yeah, the program we're looking at here, this is called Storyboard Pro. I do all of my storyboarding in, in this um, piece of software. Uh, it's a really nice kind of like all-in-one piece of software. Uh, it's, it's pretty common in TV animation. Um, it's less common in live action and feature animation, or um, live, yeah, live action and feature animation, but I use it for everything. Um, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to start with kind of my path into storyboarding. Um, talk about my career, uh, show some examples of my work um, in different um, four different mediums. Uh, and then we're going to do a storyboarding demo and try to leave some time at the end for some Q&A. Uh, here's some stuff that I've been up to recently. Um, so I worked on the first season of X-Men 97. I worked on about half of those episodes. It comes out Wednesday on Disney+. Plus. You should all watch it. Um, I got to go to the premiere uh, last week, and, and it's awesome. I think people are going to love it. Um, also coming out this summer, I worked on the Twister sequel. Um, I don't know if y'all are too too young to remember Twister, but it was a tornado movie from the, the mid-90s. It's pretty fun, and we we did a sequel to that. So that's live action. Um, and then I've also been doing some work for Nintendo on Metroid Prime 4, which has been very, very cool. So kind of runs runs the gamut of, of animation, live action, video games. Um, I, I love it all. Um, 
A little bit about me. I, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. I grew up loving loving comic books. So like that 90s Spider-Man show was was what I uh, grew up on and loved that. Um, I went to school out in Maine. I went to a little tiny college called Bowdoin College and I studied English. Um, and I thought I was gonna be a screenwriter. I always loved to draw, but I thought I was gonna write and I moved out to Hollywood when I graduated. Um, and I was was broke and not doing anything. So so it took me a little while to find my path. So if you haven't figured out your whole life yet, it's okay. It took me a while. Um, but when I got out to LA, I eventually kind of figured out that there was this job called storyboard artist, and you sort of get to use the same skill set as as comics. Like you get to you get to write, you get to draw, um, but you get to work on big movies, and they pay you like grown up money. So I was like, that's that's the one. I'm gonna do that one. So I started taking classes at CDA. Um, what was great about CDA and there's, there's other schools that kind of have this model is that uh, I could take classes from industry professionals, um, but I could sort of pay for them as I went. So rather than having to enroll full time in uh, another undergrad program or a graduate program, which, you know, could have cost me tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, this I was able to take like one class at a time kind of as I had money. So for, for me, that was was really, really great. Um, my first kind of like foot in the door professionally, um, I, I started out as an intern at, at Nickelodeon um, in post-production and sort of like archives and stuff like that. I worked um, archiving a lot of assets for this like preschool show called Nihao Kailan. It was kind of like a, a Chinese door of the Explorer. And it was really fun. And it was just like any any foot in the door is, is good that you can get. Um, after I interned at Nickelodeon, I was able to get a production assistant job at Digital Domain, which is a visual effects company. Um, so my first gig there was on Iron Man 3. And when you're a production assistant, that's like entry level work. I was like getting coffee for people and um, taking notes in meetings and, you know, things like that. But, um, but it's really important, like first step, you get to start kind of seeing how the sausage is made, how things are done. Um, you just kind of get to learn how to be professional and you get to be a fly on the wall and, and see and learn a lot of cool stuff. Um, so I was at Digital Domain for a number of years. Uh, eventually I moved up and I was uh, a coordinator for the Jungle Book. And on the Jungle Book, I was coordinating um, in the virtual art department. So we made, um, so with the Jungle Book, right, they like shot it all on a on a blue screen, a blue, blue stage. And to sort of um, prep all of this, we, shot it all on a motion capture stage with these kind of like, I know these these guys almost look like like PlayStation 2 level graphics, right? These like very basic um, 3D models, but it allowed us to kind of like pre-visualize everything. And so that was a really useful process for us. Um, and the production designer on The Jungle Book, uh, who's like the head of how everything looks on the movie, he had been a big storyboard artist in kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, the gentleman named Christopher Glass. He kind of took a liking to me. He, I had been, you know, taking all these classes at CDA and kept bothering him. I said, Chris, I want to be a storyboard artist. I want to be a storyboard artist. And finally, he's like, all right, all right, I'll give you a shot. So after the Jungle Book, he took me with him to do some commercials, um, to storyboard some commercials. And then after that, he took me with him to do uh, The Dark Tower. So The Dark Tower um, was a, a poorly received, but wonderful to work on. Uh, Idris Elba, Matthew McConaughey, Stephen King movie. Um, and so that was, but that was like my first big thing. So I got to go storyboard on this big sort of sci-fi action adventure film. Um, they brought me down to Cape Town, South Africa. So I got to live in South Africa for a few months while storyboarding this. Uh, and it was a great experience. And I got to work on a big movie. It got me into the union, which was really important. Um, so yeah, so I'll show you some boards from, from Dark Tower. Um, they, they look kind of old to me now, but you know, this is kind of, the level that I was at when I was like first first starting out and um, and like doing it professionally. So so in this sequence, um, the boy in the movie he's he's like being chased by these like bad guys who want to catch him, right? And he's escaping from like this New York City apartment. Um, so what I was trying to do here, or what my goal, what I needed to do here was like show that these bad guys were after him and kind of try to create like a an exciting chase sequence um, as they're like climbing down this, this fire escape and, and he tries to escape into the city. So um, with storyboarding this, like a lot of the point of this was to sort of help figure out like what the stunt people were gonna do and what they need to do so they could plan the shoot to do it safely and figure out what camera setups they need, right? So a lot of the time with storyboarding, not only are you making up stories, but you're helping plan things, especially for live action. You're gonna help plan visual effects or 
um, stunts or whatever so they can shoot it efficiently and safely. Um, so, okay, so the bad guy, he like jumps over the railing um, so he can like try to move down faster, right? Because he's, so I really wanted to, you know, make sure he's trying to catch the boy. So he's climbing down on the outside of the, the uh, fire escape and the boy's like running down the stairs and he's like swinging in. So he's like gaining on the boy and the boy um, sees that there's this like shop awning and this telephone booth. And so he, rather than continue climbing, the boy like decides to jump for it to try to get down faster. And so I was like, okay, he could like jump over to the awning and then from the awning over to the telephone, uh, the little like call box. Um, and then from there, he could like jump down and land on the ground and, and take off. Um, so something you'll notice about these is like, there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of posing out and I, I put some camera moves in um, that's probably fairly the most post out it gets, but some of this, you know, it's just one, one drawing. So in live action, you don't always have to pose things out as much as an animation. Um, this is what it ended up looking like in the film. So this is kind of fun. He, he jumps over to it and jumps on the telephone thing and he jumps down to the ground and runs away. So they, they shot it like pretty close to what I boarded, which is always fun. Uh, cool. Yeah. I'm just trying, kind of trying to keep an eye on my time also. Um, after Dark Tower, I, uh, did a bunch of commercials because this industry, like it's, it's a lot of it is who, you know, and when you're starting out, if you only know a couple of people, uh, that's tough. So there's some, um, management companies or agencies, uh, that, that work with storyboard artists. Um, I worked with Ampersand, but, but Famous Frames and Action Artists are, are the other big ones. And the way these places work is. Uh, they do a lot of commercial work and, and a commercial will call them. They say, hey, we have a Target commercial or whatever. Um, we need a storyboard artist for a couple of days. They say, great, Sam's available. He'll see you tomorrow. So um, so I worked with Ampersand a lot um, for, for that first year. And I probably did like 40 commercials for them that first year. So, so they kept me pretty busy. Um, and so that was a good way for me just to like get a lot of experience and meet people. And, um, and yeah, just kind of like do more work, right? Um, this was a Nerf commercial I did for them. So again, you'll see like, uh, most of them kind of helping them figure out like, what are all the camera setups we need and the shots. And, but like, I don't have to pose out every frame of like this kid jumping, right? Like the, the actor is going to do that on the day. So they just kind of need to know what they need to get. Um, but I don't actually have to like do all of the poses on this. And then, you know, they, the last shot is like the kids saying the slogan for Nerf, whatever their marketing slogan was that year. Um, this is just some other stuff that I worked on. I did a Blake Lively shark movie and an episode of this Amazon show and uh, a bunch of episodes of Angeline, which is an NBC Peacock show and, uh, and Genlock, which was a, uh, a CG animated show. Um, so these next boards I want to show you are some storyboards that I did um, for a Korean book about storyboarding that's coming out. But um, what I think is, is useful about these boards that I'm gonna show, um, these are boarded more like animation boards and I boarded them um, because they were interested in like having an example of like what storyboarding for video game cutscenes um, might look like. Um, so a couple of things you'll notice about these, these boards. Um, there's more posing out of the characters because the animators uh, it's actually useful for them to have a guide. The reason you don't want to pose out in live action as much, um, one, the actors are going to do it, and two, they might print out the storyboards and take them to set. And so like if you draw every frame and they have like 900 pages to print out and take to set, like that's actually sort of inconvenient for them, right? Um, whereas in animation, the way that it works in the animation pipeline, the animators are going to be referencing those poses um, a lot more. Um, the other thing with this, with video game boards, you know, it can depend on the video game, but generally what, what I'm trying to do with video game storyboarding is tell the player what they need to know very quickly, but um, not spend too much time being like too cinematic or too indulgent. Um, you want it to be cinematic, right? You want it to look good, but you don't want to... Basically, the last thing you want is the player looking for like the skip cutscene button, right? You want to be very efficient, tell them what they need to know about gameplay, uh, make it look good, but then like uh, let them get back to playing, right? That's, that's the goal. So um, this is just a hypothetical game. This isn't from a real video game. Um, but I was thinking, oh, this is like maybe some sort of like Dark Souls or Shadow of the Colossus type game. Um, there's like a knight and a dragon. 
Um, you'll see I, I do a lot of stuff about knights. That's my personal stuff. That's that's what I love. So, okay, so I thought, you know, okay, in gameplay, um, the knight, you like reach the valley or the boss area where this dragon is, and then you go into this cutscene. And in this cutscene, the knight walks up, and then a shadow passes over him and his horse, and the horse rears up, and the camera gets a little more frantic, and here comes this big old dragon, and it slows down with its wings, and it lands, and there's like a camera shake. And then we cut in closer, and the dragon roars, and the camera shakes again. So we're, we're establishing like kind of the stakes of this, right? You get this big old dragon we're going to have to fight. And the knight pulls out like a magic arrow. And the dragon's like, I'm not dealing with this. And the dragon takes off. He flies away down this valley. So then the knight takes off after him. And then we would go back into gameplay. So then I imagine this gameplay sequence, this is like a chase sequence. You have to like catch up to the dragon. And maybe you like target the dragon and you have he has like a lasso and you would throw it. And then once you like get close enough to lasso the dragon, then you would go into another cutscene. Uh, so then the next cutscene that you the lasso closes around the dragon's horn and the dragon, but then we reveal the dragon's flying towards a cliff. And so we sort of set up these stakes. And the horse puts on the brakes, and the knight gets thrown off. And he sweeps past camera. And then we would go back into um the next bit of gameplay. So this next bit of gameplay was like, okay, you got to climb up this rope and then like maybe damage the dragon while you're on its back, while it's flying around. So you fly up, you climb up there and you damage it to like a certain health point. Like, you know, once you get it down to 50% health or something like that, um, the next phase starts. So the next phase, uh, the dragon like roars and he's so injured now, he falls down to the earth. The knight gets thrown off. And he gets his sword ready. And then the last phase, you'd fight the dragon um, on the ground. And then once you beat him, the dragon dies. And then uh, he like maybe fades away in a bright flash of light. And you get like the prize, right? It's like a rose or something like that. And then maybe a pop-up appears when you go back to gameplay. Um, so yeah, so you can see here, like I'm posing things out more. I'm thinking about like setting up the gameplay terms that the player might need to know. Um, uh, what else? I felt like there was something else I wanted to talk about with this, um, but I don't remember what it was. So maybe that will come back to me. Um, but yeah, so you got to pose things out more. You're trying to show the player what they need to know. Um, still make it exciting to watch, but also kind of like not waste too much time. Oh, the last thing I wanted to say, the reason I'm not put doing a lot of boarding for like the actual gameplay parts um, is because the player is going to do that, right? So like, I don't want to actually draw a bunch of panels of like the knight running around and like maybe he has to stab like three weak points on the dragon or whatever, like the that's going to happen in gameplay. So I don't I don't really need to storyboard it. They'll The game designers will figure that, that part out. The player is probably controlling the camera at those points. So I don't worry about those parts. Um, okay, cool. I think we're doing pretty well on time. So yeah, so I just want to show some examples of my work and, and kind of talk about my thought process with, with those. Um, and yeah, then I kind of wanted to spend a good chunk of time doing some, just doing some drawing, doing a demo, talk about how I think about a sequence, show some of the tools that I'm using in Storyboard Pro. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what we're going to take a look at now. Um, okay, so this uh, scene that we're going to be looking at, um, I'm hoping to shoot a short film this year. Um, you know, I'd like to try to move from storyboarding into directing, and uh, you only get to be a director if you've directed stuff. So you kind of have to like, so if you want to do that, you kind of have to like start making your own movies. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and this is a little screenplay that I, a little short script, short screenplay that I wrote called Nights and Relationships. It's based on a comic by a Swedish author um, named Oscar Westberg, who very graciously said um, that I could I could take it and and film it. Um, so so Nights and Relationships. So here's like when you're storyboarding on a job or a personal project. Um, this is kind of what I do, right? And and so the first thing I do is I want to read the whole script. Um, and the reason you want to read 
the whole script uh, and not just like the one part you've been assigned. Because if you're on a, on a movie or a TV show or whatever, you're not, it's very rare that you'd board the whole thing yourself. You probably just have little bits that you're assigned and then probably other storyboard artists are doing other stuff just because it's a lot, it takes a long time. But you do want to read the whole script because you want to know like the context of everything, right? Um, where Where's the character coming from? Where do they need to go? Who is it about? Um, you know, if it's like the first action scene in the movie, you want it to be exciting, but you don't want it to like be even crazier than the last action sequence in the movie, right? You kind of, so, so you want you want that context. Um, the next thing you want to do is you want to speak to your director. So um, with, what I love about storyboarding is that you are pretty high on the creative food chain. You get to work with directly with the director of, of a big movie or a TV show or whatever. Um, and your job is to help execute their, their vision, right? Like, and the best directors are also going to ask for your input and your creativity. Um, but you also like, you want to serve their vision, right? So you want to check like, what do I need to focus on or be sure to include? Are there any movies that you want me to reference? Um, are there any limitations, right? So something like, um, might, you might need have one director who says, okay, I only want the camera somewhere that like, we really could be, right? So, so that means if we're like in car sequences or whatever, we always kind of want to stay at eye level. We want to be inside the car looking out a window, or if we're outside the car, we kind of want to be down like at bumper level or something like that. Another director might be fine with like drones that follow the cars and helicopters and big sweeping wide shots. Um, and like both are valid, right? But they're just, those are different choices. So you want to ask the director, like, do you, what do you, what do you want, right? Um, there might also be limitations, right? So the director might tell you, we only have enough VFX money to show the monster in four shots. So give me a whole monster chase sequence, but only show the monster four times. So, you know, you got to know this stuff, right? So you just got to ask. Um, they might also have other reference. You might, you might want to check with like the art department. Maybe there's a design for the monster. Um, okay, then the next thing I do is I do a thumbnail or rough pass. So that's what we're going to start with today. Um, the way that I kind of think about this is I'm trying to find like, what are the images? What are the pictures that I'm making that you're gonna look at on the screen? Um, try to make sure that they have a good cinematic composition that's interesting to look at. Um, and this is also where I'm gonna solve the choreography and the blocking, um, which is like, in, for me, the hardest part, like just kind of just tracking, like where are all the characters? Where are they moving? Where's the camera moving? Um, so all of that is like right and something that can actually be achieved. Um, and also isn't going to be confusing, right? There's like rules to cinematography that if you if you don't follow them, like the audience can be confused. So you want to watch out for that. Um, after I do a first pass, I'm going to review that with my director. Um, just kind of check, like, well, first I'll review it myself, uh, make sure that it is working. Um, I'll look for like, maybe there's places where a few of my shots are similar. And so I can think, oh, maybe that'll be the same camera setup. Whether it's live action or animation, if you can use... Um, the same camera, like more than once, that's, that's good, right? It means that like on set, they don't have to like move the camera a bunch of times. They can like put the camera one place and use it for multiple shots in animation, especially 2D animation. Um, it means that like, they're not going to have to do uh, a bunch of background paintings. Maybe they can use the same background painting a few times. So, um, you know, you want to sort of be mindful of how this stuff is going to be used. And if you can sort of help people farther down the, the, uh, the pipeline, right, um, with your boards. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, if I have time, which usually I do, but hopefully, you know, sometimes it's crazy and you got to turn in something fast, but hopefully you have time and you can like clean up your drawings and make them look a little bit nicer. Um, so then, you know, that's, that's the fun, that's like fun and easy. You put on a podcast, you put on some music and you just draw. Um, you know, the thing about cleaning up is like, you can always go more, right? Like you could always turn it into a beautiful graphic novel, but um, that is a way to like, like you can, you can get, you get yourself into trouble if you're trying to clean up too much. Um, the thing that I try to say to myself is if it's, if it's clear, it's clean. So you don't want to overdo it, but um, you also want to make sure that other people do know what they're looking at. So it's, it's it can be kind of a, kind of a push and pull. Um, I know as artists, like we always want to make it look really nice. Um, but you have to be mindful of, of your time and your sanity and if it's really helping or if you're just sort of like being indulgent. Okay, so um, let's start at the start, look at the script. So this, so I wrote this based on, on Oscar's comic. Um, this is just the first page of the script, it's like five pages, but um, 
the the idea of this oh this program is Storyboard Pro. It's made by a company called Toonboom. Toonboom Storyboard Pro. Um, yeah, and if you're a student, I think there are student prices on it. Um, I think otherwise it's like uh, I want to say it's like five hundred bucks a year for license, or it's like a thousand for like a lifetime license. Um, what I really like about it, and we can talk about this a little once we start doing some drawing, but like you kind of have everything all in one, right? You have drawing tools, um, you have an editing timeline, um, and you also can export your storyboards in a lot of different formats. So it's, it helps me stay really organized and it um, lets me kind of like deliver things to the client like really quickly and in a lot of ways. Like, do they want a PDF? Do they want an MOV? Do they want JPEGs? Do they want PSDs? I can also export like timing information that the editors can use. Um, all very, very, very quickly. Whereas like if I'm drawing in, in Photoshop or Procreate or something like that, there might be more manual stuff that I have to do to like put it in a nice template and put numbers on the template and make a PDF of it. And then they tell me they want another shot in between and after rearrange the whole template and renumber everything. I'm like, oh my God, like that's, that's like, I don't, I don't want to do, deal with that, right? I want to draw, I want to focus on storytelling. And so that, um, this lets me be, be efficient with that. Um, okay, so this script. So the script is about these two knights who um, kind of run into each other. They have this chance encounter on the road. And at first, you don't know if they're going to like pull out their swords and kill each other or what. And they kind of have, there's clear that there's some like tension between them. Um, and you start realizing like, oh, these guys like actually know each other. They have some history. And you kind of realize like, oh, they're exes, right? And and so the I, what I like about this script is that... Um, you know, it's it's kind of cool and high concept. There's knights in it, but it's sort of like um, still kind of has a human feeling to it. Like when you when you run into your your ex girlfriend, your ex boyfriend, whatever, you sometimes you kind of feel like a knight, right? Your guard is up, you're tense. Um, you're not sure if you're gonna fight or not, and you're trying to like both be cool. Um, and it's small too, right? Like for for shooting my first short film, it's just a couple actors. It can be one location, right? Um, anyway, so that's what this is about. Um, this is the first page of it. Um, so uh, will it be posted on Brick YouTube? I don't know, but it is being recorded. So hopefully, probably. Yes, says Brick. Okay, cool. So, um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is like, I'm gonna read the script. Just like, what am I looking at here? Um, things I'm gonna ask myself, who's the main character? What do they want? Uh, what's in their way? Um, and what happens? Do they succeed, fail, or something else? I'm also gonna try to look at like, what stuff do I need to like ask art department or the director, right? So, you know, where are we? Okay, we're in a mountain forest at dusk. Um, who's the main character? All right, well, I see a knight. His name is Sir Artigal. So we'll, we'll like remember him. Got a bunch of weapons and gear and stuff. Uh, you know, this is the action notes. If you've never looked at a, a script before, like you have like action stuff um, and you have dialogue. Okay, then we have another location. It's a campsite. And there's another knight, Sir Brittamark. Um, and she's like hanging some charms and talismans and she gets interrupted by Artigal. And then we have some dialogue. And so she looks for her weapons. Uh, she's like, it's you. Artigal puts his hands up in peace. He's like, I'm not here to fight. They relax, they're cautious. Um, and she's kind of like, what are the odds? Uh, and it's uncomfortable. And, they, and then we have some dialogue, right? We get into some dialogue. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to read the whole thing first. Then I'm going to go talk to my director, which in this case is me, but for the sake of, you know, this argument or this this presentation, um, I'm going to say, hey, like, what is the mood or the tone? Is there any reference you want? Is there any other notes? And uh, I say to myself, yeah, okay. So like one, like look at, at Oscar's original comic. Like what's, is there anything cool in here that we want to make sure we keep? Is there any like, vibes right um you know he kind of like he this is like an awkward pose he's kind of like looking away he's kind of like i like this pose maybe we keep that in there um you know and eventually we get to a point where they're kind of like cool sitting next to each other um the director's probably gonna have movies that they want to look at right so here's some like movies that i definitely want to look at for this you know it's about two nights meeting in the woods um and having a talk so i'm definitely gonna look at green knight uh, I'm definitely going to look at Seventh Seal, which is about a knight uh, talking to the devil. Um, it's a very classic film, um, definitely worth looking up. Um, 
this may be less important for storyboarding, but sometimes you want to think about light when you're storyboarding. Um, it's like what movies have really good night photography, campfires. Uh, True Grit is, is a wonderful, wonderful movie. It looks great. Uh, the Revenant also. Um, really nice. Like, uh, you still have, like, what I like is it's it's night, but you still get some uh, forest in the background. Um, and you get this really just nice contrast that makes the characters pop, right? Like, they're really warm. And then the background's really cool. It's really blue, right? So, like, that's that separation is really nice. Oh, should we know how to write a script? Uh, absolutely, yes. I think I think knowing how to write is is like criminally undertaught to storyboard artists. Um, there's a book that I had on the screen back here. Screenplay by Sid Field. This is people will tell you that like oh this book is like dated. It's like the old like Hollywood way to write scripts. Like ignore those people. Um, like learn the fundamentals. And this is the book that will teach you the fundamentals get it from the library the library will have a copy i promise you um like like learn the fundamentals of screenwriting before you go try to like be christopher nolan writing writing tenant like learn those fundamentals first um it's a very good book it's easy to read definitely check it out um yeah and there's a lot of good stuff out there right i mean there's a lot of good books there's a lot of good classes on screenwriting there's books on writing tv pilots if you're more interested in tv but understanding like how a script and how a scene are put together, um, even if your goal isn't to like be a writer, is going to help you so, so, so much as a storyboard artist. Cause it's gonna allow you to know like, what's the point of the scene? Who's the main character? What am I supposed to be focusing on, right? Like um, we all love to draw, but like understand, like really our job is like understanding the story and being able to draw is sort of the way that we can execute that, right? Okay, uh, so nights and relationships. So this is what I'm looking at. I've got this script, okay. Um, I'm also going to ask, hey, art department, do you have like designs yet? Um, I just drew these. I haven't figured out the costumes for my characters yet. That's that's a problem that I'm going to deal with later. Uh, three books. Um, yes, I will. I will do that at the end. I will definitely. I have like a giant bookshelf over there, and I'll I'll grab three three good ones for sure. Um, so I just did these designs. This would be like pie in the sky. I don't know what armor I'm going to find yet. Um, I got feelers out there to all my nerd friends, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, so so there's two knights. There's Artigal. His armor is like going to be newer. Grudemar's armor is like a little beat up. Um, so, uh, okay, so so now I'm going to thumbnail this thing. Um, I like to have bullet points if I can. I like to write bullet points if I can, just to kind of like think through it a little more granularly. Like the script is going to have some direction, but um, but it's not gonna tell you what shots to use, right? That's like kind of your job. So I'm gonna start thinking about that. Um, drawing a map can be really helpful, both for you to keep everything straight and for everybody on set. Um, so you might draw a map and think about that. Um, and then I'm gonna thumbnail it, looking for graphic compositions. Um, and we can kind of talk about that as we draw. So I went ahead and I wrote these bullet points because I didn't wanna make you guys like sit here while I was like just staring into space and thinking about these. Um, but, you know, so like as I'm reading this script um, and maybe depending on what I've, excuse me, talked about with my director, um, you know, I'm going to kind of have some images that I've thought of. Like, okay, first maybe he's like, we have this like wide shot of he's walking uphill and then maybe we get closer so we can get a better look at his armor and stuff. And then we know that like the woods are dangerous. So like maybe there's like a sound, like he hears like a wolf howl. So maybe he looks back at it and then he like hurries on. And then I know he's got to get over to this campsite. Um, Close-ups can be nice. So like maybe there's like a close-up of his feet or something like that. Um, and so we could like see his feet walking and then they stop. Um, like that might be cool. Uh, and then we could like go to his face and see his reaction. And then we could cut to what he's looking at. And we could see the other night and she turns and sees him. And then she looks over at her weapons. So we're gonna have like her looking at her weapons. Um, and then we're going to pan from her weapons back to Sir Artigal. Um, and then as they start talking, we can maybe get into like what, what's called like standard coverage, which is like shot reverse shot. Um, you wanna be like thoughtful about it. If you can find something more interesting to do, you should, but like, give me a good place to start. Um, yeah, it's a very, very simple map, right? So like, I'm thinking, okay, here's Artigal, which uh, I made him blue in that drawing. So let's make him blue. 
Here's Britomar, she's purple. Um, you know, and so he's he's here, her weapons are over here. Um, so if you if you looked at any storyboarding stuff before or cinematography stuff, you might have heard of something called the uh, the 180 line. Um, so basically what that is, if you haven't heard of that, you want to like the way I think about it is you imagine you have like a piece of string, an invisible piece of string that connects the characters. And you only want to shoot on one side of that. And that's going to like mean that like no matter where I put my camera, this is a camera here, like in the in the image created by this camera. Here, this is a better example. Right? We'll put the camera here. This is a this would be a really wide lens, but if you put the camera there, the image that's created by that means that Britomart is always going to be on the right, and Artigal is all oops, Artigal is always going to be on the left. Um, right, I can put the camera here, and I'm going to like get that. That's going to like stay consistent, right? I can put the camera over here, and it's going to stay consistent, right? He's going to be on the left, she's going to be on the right. Um, but if I, what's called jumping the line, if I jump the line, and I put the camera over here, um, now, if I make that picture, Artigal would be on the right, and Brunemart on the left. And so if I had a camera like over here and over here and I was cutting between them, it could get really confusing, like who's on, who's where. Uh, how do you decide on which cameras and angles to use? Any tips, advice on building a visual library for camera? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, we'll talk, I'll talk about that next. Um, okay, yeah, so this is, so that's the line, um, just something to like be mindful of. Um, yeah, and just, just think about that. Um, try to keep that in mind. It'll prevent your audience from getting confused. Okay, so. Um, how do you think, how do you pick what cameras shots to use? So there are rules of cinematography. One of the books I'll recommend, and I'll, I'll write all these down at the end, is The Five C's of Cinematography. I think it's by Joseph Muskelly. Um, it's a pretty boring book, but it does lay out all the rules of cinematography. So it's worth going through. Um, so there are kind of like traditional rules to shots and editing that help prevent an audience from being confused. As a general rule of thumb, you kind of want to start wide and, and get narrow. So you start with like a wide, wide shot. Think about a sitcom, right? You're going to see like the outside of the house and then you'll like cut into the kitchen and then the characters are going to walk around and they're going to like tell some jokes. And then maybe, I mean, a sitcom, you don't usually cut to a close up, but like maybe somebody like does like a funny face and like you would go in a close up for that. So you usually start wider, get closer. And then at the end of the scene, you usually go wide again. Um, this is like the basic way to do it. You, like if you go watch a movie, you'll find exceptions to this, of course, right? Um, in uh, Japanese films, especially like anime, they sometimes start uh, like like Hideaki Anno, who who does like the Evangelion stuff. Um, he likes to go. Sometimes he likes to start with close up stuff, so you're kind of like it's kind of building mystery and interest before he goes to a wide. Um, so there's like other ways to do it, right? And like those can definitely be valid. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, like start wide, go close. Um, and then we can talk about other other sort of like shots um, as we go. Um, okay, so something that's nice about Storyboard Pro, I also have these like boxes over here, right? I have action notes, dialogue. Um, and uh, I can like sort of keep track of all that stuff. So the first shot I said, okay, it's a wide tracking, right? wide shot tracking Sir Artigal uphill. So we're we're gonna work really rough and loose. It's like a good way to work. Sometimes working small also helps. So let's say like we're going uphill. Maybe there's some trees. It's nice to have stuff like in the foreground, the midground, and the background, right? Because it gives us kind of a sense of space. And then here's Sir Art Artigal. Yeah, I can't even say his name. He has like a cool cape. And then maybe there's some stuff in the background, right? There's like some some like he's like traveling through the mountains, right? And we can put a little arrow in here to show that he's going uphill. Um, and then something you can do in Storyboard Pro that's really nice is you can like extend this background. And I can put in camera moves also. So I can put in keyframes. You see these two keyframes up here. And I can drag my end keyframe. And so then when I'm in this timeline, it'll actually like move, right? So that's my first shot. It's going to be wide on this night. 
Uh, then we're going to cut in closer. And I said closer on Archicon. OK, cool. So maybe we're like, uh, do you recommend color coding your characters? Yeah, so the reason I, that I color code my characters, um, it's more common in animation than live action, but it's helpful in everything. Um, if you fill them with like a light pastel fill, um, it can be really helpful. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, to because because the storyboards are going to get shipped like overseas usually like a lot of um, uh, oh it's blue isn't he um, a lot of two D series animation um, you know like like X Men or uh, Legend of Korra or whatever a lot of that is done overseas a lot of that's in Korea um, and so it just helps like minimize any any confusion right and so if you kind of like talk to your team you figure out like Hey, these characters are gonna be these colors. This character's gonna be that color. Um, you know, it's it's helpful. It can just kind of help visually like track everything quickly. Um, and in live action too, like I I've done it on movies where like I have ensemble casts and like nobody's ever been mad at me for doing it. Um, because my goal really is to like again is to like make a blueprint for everybody downstream. Um, so like things uh are clear. Um, and you know like okay, so he could be walking like that. Um. Be more interesting. I think this was actually in a comic. It is maybe he's like kind of got his like cape pulled over him. Like maybe it's like really cold here. That would be like that kind of makes like the stakes a little higher, right? So like his arm is kind of under here, and he's like pulling this cape. Like maybe he's like even got both arms like wrapped around himself, and then his head could be kind of like hunkered down a little bit more, um, right? Uh, like really make the audience like not want to be out here. Um, I'm not going to have a snow machine, but it's fun to think about. Maybe there's some like snow or rain or something like that. Uh, and he's walking toward the camera. Uh, okay, what do I say next? Medium reverse, looks back at noise. Okay, so I thought this would be like, yeah, like maybe he like, we'll put in a background first. So let's say he's like, it's like kind of going uphill. It's like a little rough perspective grid. And like, say the forest is up here, these are the trees. And then he, uh, now he's moving. We said back when we drew our map that he's gonna be moving like left to right, right? That's our goal. So if he's looking behind him, we really should try to have them look on the left side of screen, the right side of screen, screen right, screen left. He's gonna look back over his shoulder his cape. He's looking back um, when he hears like the howl. And then uh, and then he's going to keep going. So here's something else we can do in Storyboard Pro. We can duplicate this whole panel. So now we have two of these. And then I don't have to like draw the background again. Right. So I can like take him and I even can onion skin this so I can like see the previous panel. <clears throat> And I'm gonna draw like this is this is his cape blowing, and he like continues on. Right. So now we're like kind of getting a little sequence together. Um, you know, moving uphill, he's bundled up, he looks back at a noise, and then he like keeps going. We'll do like another one or two. Uh, and then we'll we can like do some QA. We can keep drawing too. Um okay. So yeah, I thought it would be cool. Um, and I'll have to think about this, like the best way to do this. Like we could have, I thought it'd be cool to like see his feet like walking on the ground. There's the ground, there's like some grass, rocks. Um, you know, do we want to see this like in profile or do we want to see this like, could see his feet walking like from the front. I think either way, like it'll be this is like some feet. I think either way, like you'll know what you're looking at, but you know, is one better than the other? I think I would lean towards this, right? Because I think you have a nicer silhouette of that foot. Um, it's gonna like be more clear. I think also like when you're shooting something profile, there's kind of like directionality to it. And so if he like 
it's like easier to see direction like side to side than like that neutral. So I think if that foot like is walking and then stops, um, it'll give a different feeling to the audience. Like, oh, he was, he's like been on this journey and like now he stopped in his tracks. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of this one. I don't like this one. So we'll delete that. You throw away storyboards a lot. Um, you try stuff, it doesn't work. You try something, the director doesn't like it. You throw it out. You try something, everybody loves it. And then it turns out, oh, we don't have the whatever. So this plan is changing. Um, this is the name of the game. Uh, I know this is rough and sometimes I have to work like this in my thumbnails, break down key scenes in my head. Sometimes I struggle connecting them. Oh, to connect scenes. Yeah, sure. Okay, right. So um, yeah, this is like, I definitely know artists who work like this. Like I personally, I'm kind of like a straight ahead guy. Um, I kind of like just carve through the thing. Um, and I think sometimes I'm, I've kind of like internalized, like trying to go wide to close. Um, but sometimes like, Oh, hi, buddy. Uh, my toddler is here. He says, hello. Where are you? Hi, pal. Yeah. Are you going to help me? Um, but it's, I think, not uncommon, like, as you're reading a script that, like, you'll, like, images will pop into your head and it can be good. Oh, everybody says, everybody says hi, pal. Yeah. Yeah, go with mommy. Mommy's taking you to the park. Sorry, I didn't say. It's okay. Have fun, guys. Um, Images like will pop into your head and and I think it's worth it to like jot those down, right? So like, um, let's say like later on, uh, what was I thinking later on? Like she could look at him. Oh, right. So like later I had this idea that like maybe she um, like looks, she's she like looks over at her weapons. All right, I have one of those helmets like the, uh, um like the orcs have in uh in lord of the rings i think it's called the salet the cool helmet so like i kind of want her to look when she looks right to left that's going to motivate our next cut to be her point of view on her weapons so she looks over and her weapons are like you know here's some trees and a rock and whatever her weapons are leaning against this tree and like she can't get to them fast enough um so like hopefully this guy is not here to like kill her because otherwise she'll have a problem and i thought it'd be cool if we like see her weapons and then we pan over to see artigal right and he's like over here and he's like i'm not gonna kill you and then like this we like put in this camera move here uh like that Right, so the shot would be like, she looks, and we go from there to there. So like, I had this shot that I kind of liked, um, but then like, yeah, like you said, like sometimes you got stuff like in between and you're like, oh man, how do I like get from there to there? Um, that's just kind of some of the problem solving, right? Like you're gonna know what, um, how do you like motivate these cuts to get from shot to shot? We wanna, we were also kind of trying to go wide to close. Um, so sometimes you just got to like try stuff. Sometimes you got to like think through your rules of cinematography, see if that will give you an answer. You can also try bullet pointing things. Um, and you might try stuff that like doesn't work. Um, and sometimes that's how it goes. Right. Um, okay. We have like about 10 minutes left. Um, have I, I'm just going to like scroll up real quick and make sure I haven't like missed anything question wise. Um, it feels like this is. I would say like, I'm, I've been okay, I think, keeping an eye on the chat. So like, I would say just keep throwing questions in there. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, Lou has a really awesome tip in here. Study movies. Yeah, like that's that's great. Um, like go through a movie that you like, um, and especially like a good, solid, like, um, you know, don't watch like something like super crazy and experimental. Um, watch something like with really good fundamentals. And pause the movie every time there's a cut and draw a little thumbnail. It doesn't have to be a brilliant drawing, um, but it's going to help you start seeing like what the flow of shots are and how they're motivating what shot cuts to what. Um, so like honestly, any like Pixar movie, any Spielberg movie, um, you know, like Jurassic Park, Raiders of the Lost Ark, watch um Empire Strikes Back, watch Jaws, uh, all those like Pixar classics, like. All of those are just going to have good, good, good fundamentals, solid filmmaking. Those are great to study. 
Um, does camera movement help with transitions? Yeah, it does. Like you, um, yeah, like camera moves are really like, and, and, and like camera moves and editing, it's like something that you can always, always get better at. But like, so for example, this shot, right, where she like, I want her to like, she's going to be like looking at him, right? She's going to look, be looking like slightly um, left to right or right to left, excuse me. Um, she's right. She's like, she's like you. And then she like looks over something you might do to like kind of ease that cut over to her weapons is you actually could, um, yeah, put in a little bit of camera, like left to right here. Right. So you could, so she could go you, and then like, see how there's like a little camera that can kind of help tell us like which way we're going. Right. So like that can be helpful. Um, and yeah, like, like you can also just, uh, just watch if you want, if now I don't have like an example off the top of my head, but like, like using those moves, uh, can definitely help motivate a cut. Um, I'm trying to think of an, an example, like, uh, like a, a camera could like, this is like stupid. Right. But like, uh, I'm thinking about like in the matrix when that camera, when Neo touches the mirror and it like the goop, like goes inside his mouth. I think the camera like goes all the way down his throat and then it like cuts to like kind of his POV and waking up. And so like that move kind of puts us inside Neo's head. Right. Um, how do you train yourself to draw simple and fast? Um, the irony with drawing simple and fast is, Oh, and I missed, uh, another one, um, which I will get back to. How do you train yourself to draw simple and fast? Um, the irony of drawing simple and fast is that you need to draw slow, right? Like go slow to go fast. Um, the reason that I can move quickly is because I've done a lot of figure drawing. Um, and that has like internalized it and also kind of helped me figure out how to break down the figure in a way that like is, is efficient for me. So I would say go to figure drawing or life drawing if you can find those. Um, and if not, there's like online figure drawing. Um, Bodies in Motion is a really good one. Um, and focus on um, anything in like the 30 second to one minute um, figure drawing, like that's really what's going to be useful for you to figure out like, oh, how do I, you know, like break down like a head and you know, like what's my like line of action for a character and usually the shoulders and the waist will be moving counter to one another. And uh, see, this is a terrible drawing, but like, um, so, but like this person, this knight has a shield up and they have a sword in their offhand, you know, I'm like looking for silhouettes and see that I'm, I'm not even saving what I started with. Right. But um, yeah, and because then after this, right, like I can always sit there and like, you know, figure out like, oh, all the details of whatever and, you know, make it make it proper. But um, but moving quick and getting that gesture down um, really is very important for storyboarding. Um, one, just because you have so many drawings that you have to do that, like, you can't sit there and make everything perfect. Um, and, like, especially for live action or commercials or something, sometimes it's, like, they might be shooting that commercial, like, in two days. So, like, get them something quickly, right? Um, okay, what else do we have? Uh, what do you recommend having a storyboarding portfolio? What I would recommend having, first, what I would recommend is think about what storyboarding work you want to be doing. Because um, there's a lot of different stuff you can you could be working on, right? Do you want to be working on like anime influenced action adventure animation? Like you try and for those jobs on uh, Castlevania, Legend of Korra, um, Invincible, um, X-Men, right? Like that portfolio is going to look different than if you're trying to get live action commercial work, right? If you're trying to get live action commercial work, you need to have a car commercial, a beer commercial, a makeup commercial, um, you know, something like with like visual gags, but like for live action, right? And like, those are gonna look different than if you're trying for a job on Family Guy or uh, Rick and Morty or whatever, right? Those, you need to have a lot of comedy stuff and this, and certainly Family Guy, the staging is much flatter. So what I would really recommend is figure out what types of shows you wanna be on and then make like three samples that could be like a sequence on those shows. Uh, are there any programs more affordable for storyboarding? Um, yeah, I mean, so so like you can learn Storyboard Pro on the job, 
right? Like if you have a good portfolio. Um, Storyboarder is one. Um, Procreate, I think is pretty affordable if you've got an iPad. Um, I think of Photoshop's, like you can get like the Adobe Photographer package and it's it's only like, it's, it's like 15 or 20 bucks a month. Like it's not, it's not that bad. Um, so I would, I would try that. Um, honestly, if you're like super duper on a budget, uh, I would check with your library. Like a lot of libraries have stuff you can use. Like they may have Cintiqs and like Adobe subscriptions. Like, like I would check. Um, and, and like you absolutely can storyboard in Photoshop. I just like storyboard pro. Um, okay. I usually do animatics with my boards, but is there a preference to put stills, not animated boards in your portfolio? Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people nowadays are using um, speaker deck. So speaker deck, you can upload like a PDF and that, that like somebody can click through. And that's a really nice way for somebody to review it because they can like click through it and like sort of see how that motion plays, but they can watch it at their own speed um, rather than like having just stills or an animatic that's like playing. So I would look at, at speaker deck. Um, I have not personally used it, but a lot of people are using that. So I would look at speaker deck. Um, do recorded panels become saved anywhere so we can rewatch them? Uh, earlier, someone from Brick said yes. Uh, Proko's YouTube channel, I don't know it, but I would say check it out. Sounds great. Uh, Clip Studio Paint. Oh, yeah, Clip Studio. I have had Clip Studio for years and I've never opened it. Um, I need to learn it because everybody says Clip Studio is awesome. Um, okay. Uh, yes, take the summit survey. Yeah, there's good links in the chat. Um, <clears throat> and follow Brick on social. Oh, books. Let me grab a couple books. Um, okay. I don't know what I did with my copy of screenplay, which is awful because that was the one I was recommending the most. Um, I also, but screenplay by Sid Field, uh, five C's, oh, AI, oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you an earful on AI. Um, oh, let me unblur my camera. Uh, here, well, I'll stop my share. This video, don't blur. Sorry, my apartment's a mess. Uh, five C's of cinematography by Joseph Maskelly. That's really good. Um, this one's really good. This is called Professional Storyboarding. It's by Sergio Paez, who runs uh, some big storyboarding website, and Anson Ju. He's a live action storyboard artist. Um, this one's really good. Got like three minutes left. Okay. Um, for writing, this is another good writing book. This is The Scene Book by Sandra Schofield. Um, so, a scene, you know, it's, it's a scene in a movie. So, it kind of talks to you like how to think about like what is the shape and structure of a scene. As a storyboard artist, usually you'll be boarding like a scene. So, Scene Book, Sandra Schofield, it's a writing book, not a drawing book, but it's a good one. Um, this one's not bad either. This is called The Visual Story. It's by Bruce Block. Um, it's also kind of a, a cinematography one. Um, visual Story, Bruce Block. Okay, uh, how will AI impact storyboard artists? I mean, there's a lot that remains to be borne out about AI. The thing about AI is that um, certainly for boarding uh, and even for concept, it's it's not better than us. It is faster and cheaper, right? And so it is going to hurt people like you who are trying to break in and get those entry level jobs, right? More senior artists are going to be a little more protected because, um, you know, they've got experience, they're in demand with higher clients who are willing to pay for like human made stuff. Um, storyboarding is so specific, you know, like earlier we were talking about, like, does a director want the camera subjective or do they want drone shots or whatever? The AI storyboarding stuff that is out there right now is awful at that stuff. It, it can't do it. It doesn't mean that a cheap producer isn't going to try. There's a lot of stuff that still has to shake out with AI. Like, are they going to lose all these court cases because all of their software only runs on stolen material, right? If they if they get popped for copyright, all of that stuff may go away. Um, it's always going to be around. Cheap people are always going to try to undercut artists. Um, be vocal, right? Like audiences are booing AI stuff when they see it, and that's awesome. And and you should keep doing that. Um, and just try to do good work and work with other people. Um, Talk to your your government representatives. Um, you know, if you're American, your your state and federal representatives and senators. If you're international, you know, whoever represents you there. Um, we're a ways away from storyboarding being like hit as bad as concept, but like 
you know, we got to be vigilant on this. Okay. Uh, oh my God. Um, how come I, uh, yes. Connect with me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, message me. If you have questions afterwards, I'm very accessible. I love to help people. Um, yes. Yeah, storyboard art. Okay. Yeah. Um, film directing shot by shot. That is another one. It's upstairs next to my bed. Um, I'm like slowly reading it. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Like, we're like at time. Um, so, you know, I, I know there's other sessions and stuff. Thank you very much. Reach out if you have more questions. This has been really fun. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.